Okay. Well, welcome everyone. I am Nick Chase from Marantis. I'm Eric Gregory. Okay. Also from Marantis. <laughs> As you can tell by our our new our new um, I don't know if you can see it. I don't know where how to point to it, but went that way anyway <laughs> we have our logo up there now which i think is is pretty cool thank you to lisa our producer for for doing that we're moving on up yeah i know i know it's, it's almost like we know what we're doing <laughs> i don't want to i don't want to give anybody the wrong impression though you know so uh, anyway um so welcome everyone to today's news um so we have several topics here today that we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about uh, distributed computing, some new tools, uh, some five G news, uh, some diversity, some interesting diversity news from CNCF, and, and of course our our ever present security segment, which I think is just gonna have to be a regular feature at this point, and then some fun stuff if we have time to get to it. We'll have to come up with a name for the security segment, like, you know, the eternal security corner or something. I don't know. <laughs> the eternal. Yes, that's right. We, we, need, we need a name for, for the eternal security corner, something like that. Uh, so if, if you have suggestions, um, put them in the comments because we, we would very much uh, uh, like to hear that. Because um, Lord knows, Lord knows, uh, there's going to be something every week. Uh, it's just the world in the which truth. we live. So, um, all right. So let's, uh, so let us get started. Let us get started. So uh, CNCF has announced that they are including, uh, that they have accepted a new tool into to the pantheon of, of incubated uh, projects. Uh, this one is called uh, Dapper, spelled D-A-P-R, um, and uh, it is used for simulating the building of uh, distributed applications, which, of course, is uh, is our cloud-native world. So uh, it works by uh, it works by sitting as a sidecar, and it provides services for publishing and subscribing. Um, managing state and, and secrets and uh, managing triggers and so on, so on and so forth. All of the things that you need to build into a distributed application that um, you would otherwise need to reinvent the wheel. So I, I think it's a, a pretty, it sounds like it could be a pretty useful thing. I have not yet used it. Uh, what I find particularly useful is uh, they have managed to uh, provide this in three different forms. Uh, there is the raw API. Uh, there is an SDK for uh, programmers who want to uh, use it, and uh, and also a CLI tool. So uh, that is particularly useful. Do you have any experience with any of this uh, type of stuff, Eric? Um, I'm interested in how agnostic it uh, seems to be trying to be for uh, programming languages, for frameworks, uh, for the various approaches that uh, you know you just listed that it, a developer might take. Um, and I haven't played with Dapper yet, but I like saying it. Uh, they chose an excellent name. And <laughs> I'm uh, looking forward to playing around with it. They have a self-hosted module uh, or a self-hosted mode uh, that I seems to be designed really primarily for experimentation on a local development environment. Uh, and I'm definitely going to spend some time playing around with that. Well, that's that's good. I haven't seen the um, I haven't seen the self-hosted uh, uh, mode yet, but I'll tell you what. Um, we're going to drop here in the chat uh, sort of a, a getting started for uh, for people to use. So you can go in there, take a look at it. Uh, one thing that I find particularly interesting uh, about this is that uh, their roadmap has a configuration API. And it's not necessarily for uh, doing configuration but rather for, I mean, I suppose you probably can do configuration with it, but for detecting changes in configuration. And in these distributed applications, that's, I mean, so important in order to know uh, what is going on. Right. So 
Uh, so that is the new tool that is out there. Uh, and as you can see, they have, uh, they have brought back the, the missing E as we have, uh, I, I thought we were past that in our world, but apparently we are not, <laughs> um, but that's okay. That is okay. You know, if it's um, as fun to say as dapper, I support it. Th there you go. There you go. I mean, that's it. At, at least it's, at least it's fun to say. So, you know, okay. And, and you, and you have Eric's seal of approval and what else could you want? <laughs> what, what else could you really want? So, all right. So that is, uh, so that is that, uh, our next piece, uh, has to do with, uh, 5G. So, um, full disclosure here, I'm not a network engineer. Uh, and for many of you out there who are not network engineers, uh, you're probably going to listen to all of this and go, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and that's fine because uh, before I did the research for this, I didn't know what I was talking about either. So that's all right. Um, but here's the point that I'm kind of making here. The fact that this is coming up and, and we're actually even talking about it is, uh, is something that we should consider a, an advancement in, in the field. Okay. Because otherwise I, I would have just looked and went up oh, telco stuff. Don't care. Don't know. Don't care. Um, basically what it comes down to is this. Um, 5G, which we all know from, you know, all of the commercials for your phones is not just for your phones. Um, 5G is getting to the point now where, uh, it is, uh, and there's, there was a blog post from, from VMware actually talking about this, where they feel like 5G is starting to, uh, starting to give SD-WAN, so, so software-defined wide area networks, the power to potentially unseat sort of the current, uh, sort of the current means for uh, de ultra-dependable data transfer, uh, multi-protocol label switching or MPLS. So let's talk about what that means, because that's a lot of Acronyms. A lot of acronyms out here for us. There's a lot of acronyms, and there's more. There's more acronyms that I haven't even said yet. So let me explain what this means, okay? For people looking, going, I, 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 I don't know. Okay. So, as you know, um, enterprises particularly send a lot of data around to a lot of different places. Okay. They, there's their networks. There's voice over IP. There's real time data. There's situations where it's really important for the data to go from point A to point B, and it's got to get there. Okay. There's, it's just not negotiable. And a lot of times um, that is handled by uh, multi protocol label switching or MPLS. Okay. And the thing about MPLS is it is proprietary, but it's extremely reliable. So it's the kind of thing that you get from your phone company or your other communication service provider. Okay. So you got MPLS, very reliable, kind of expensive, um, and relies on the hardware, you know, the, the, the actual network wiring. Okay. So that's one way to do things. So then proprietary, you have, hardware based, and expensive. Just that's right. Proprietary, track. hardware based. Yes, the 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 trinity right there. <laughs> um, so that's it's not, but it's very, but it's very reliable. And you know, there are times when you just need that kind of reliability. Okay, great. But then there's software defined wide area networks. So SD WAN. Okay, so we. Probably most of us have heard of WANs, okay? Uh, the idea here is those are sort of, uh, those are open source, the, you know, it's, it's software defined. So it's much more flexible. You can, uh, 
uh, determine where the traffic is going and so on and so forth. Um, but while it's more flexible, less expensive, also not as reliable as MPLS. So, And my understanding too is that even if it's more flexible, you can also run into a ceiling with it. Like you could use SD-WAN over 4G, but most organizations probably wouldn't on account of cost and data limitations. Uh, so I think that gets to where this 5G move is starting to change the landscape a little bit. Exactly correct. Exactly correct. So, so what happens now? So now we bring in 5G. Okay, so 5G, you've got this increased bandwidth, uh, you've got the ability to do network slicing, which you can control different, you know, different portions of the spectrum. Um, and so now you remove a lot of those problems with SD-WAN. You can make it more reliable, you remove some of those bandwidth caps. So now what happens with MPLS. Okay. So does it become, does it replace MPLS? Does it just, you know, sit alongside M MPLS? And um, what the communication service providers are doing, there's, there's, there's our uh, another, there's our CSPs, another acronym for us. Um, what they want to do is they want to basically uh, set up multi access edge compute nodes or MEX. There's another one. Um, and those would sit sort of outside of the enterprise, just, just outside the enterprise in order to allow, so, so you would deploy the SC-WAN to that node and you'd have this low latency because now you're kind of intertwined with the CSP's network. OK, so um, that is kind of how the CSPs are uh, are reacting to this, which I think is a is a smart move, because this way enterprises still get to use uh, those CSP networks, but they're no longer kind of locked into this uh, more expensive uh, way of doing things. So it, it kind of. Uh, it's funny because it, it, it ties into the the way of working with edge that we don't really think of. When most people think edge, they think, oh, you know, we we put uh, you know we put stuff out on the 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 outside where it's closer to the users. You know, like um, you know we've we've got our uh, our processing power out on the edge, and then we send information back into the network. That's one way to think of edge. The other way to think of edge is to move the center out to the outside. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, an example of that. Sort of further decentralizing that enterprise network. Exactly. Right? exactly. But yeah, and so what you're doing is you're taking the, the central network and you're bringing it to the outside instead of taking the outside and bringing it back to the central network. So it's interesting to kind of look at it uh, from from that perspective. So that is uh, so that is that that is that one. Perhaps right. some intimations so, of the the edge feature there. Uh, it definitely definitely. So it'll be interesting to see sort of uh, where that goes. Obviously, you know, if you're not a CSP, you know, you'll want to talk to your cloud provider about this. But there's nothing much to necessarily do right now except to keep an eye uh, on that. So you want to take the next one? Absolutely. Uh, so we uh, have seen over the last week or so uh, that the Cloud Native Computing Foundation has released the results of a microsurvey that they ran uh, around diversity, equity, and inclusion issues in the open source community. Uh, specifically with contributions to open source projects that the CNCF might have some vested interest in. Uh, and they've also talked a little bit about some inclusion initiatives uh, that, that they're sponsoring and, and uh, pushing and the, kind of some of the results that are coming out of that. Uh, so I guess first we'll talk about the survey a little bit. Uh, 
in this um, community survey on questions of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which sometimes we see acronymized, back to acronyms, <laughs> as, as DEI, um, like we saw, I guess what surprised me was a pretty positive responses across the board, but when you broke it down uh, in, in a granular way, kind of what you would expect. You saw the most positive um summary of the landscape as it stands now uh, uh as an equitable space as an inclusive space from those you know perhaps with traditionally the most power uh so uh for the results here do, do, do. so basically you know straight white men are happiest with the situation <laughs> for the for the blunt summary <laughs> that's, that's the blunt that's the blunt summary however however you know non-straight white men uh are also fairly hopeful of the situation um i i think they were saying that um it was something like i don't have it in front of me but it was either 84 percent of you know straight white guys down to you know 75 percent of everyone else or something similar to that yeah i wanted to bring up the exact numbers so we've got yeah. overall 75 percent of respondents said that open source is becoming more inclusive that was the question is the community becoming more inclusive so that's you know that that's a good result and i think where it's uh in some ways more positive even though there are differences in the individual groups or when you break it down so we see that uh men are slightly more likely to feel a strong sense of belonging in the open source community uh, with 77 percent saying that they agree or strongly agree with that sentiment versus 71 percent of women and 64 percent of non-binary individuals uh so clearly there's uh, a difference there clearly that's a difference that the cncf is very interested in addressing um but overall you have a fairly positive sentiment here um and i'm i'm framing that i guess a little more positively than they would they they kind of come away with the conclusion of there's room for improvement and you know clearly there is um but it definitely suggests a a hopeful trajectory i think it definitely, definitely. I found a couple of things very interesting about this survey. Number one, um, there was there were a small number of people who felt that who completely disagreed with you know strongly disagree with the idea that you know I feel a strong sense of community, mm -hmm. uh, and and they were the men. Mm. So it's like the one category where you would think that people would be happy with this was the one category where where people were not there was nobody in there was nobody in the non-binary or female categories who strongly disagreed with that statement that is fascinating it, it is totally fascinating another thing that i found really interesting is um the number of is the number of people who uh who identified as not uh, not straight. Okay. I mean, there was, uh, there were, there were a great number of people. So, uh, let me, so for, for the gender breakdown, so they had 72% of respondents were male, 22 were female, 4% were non-binary and, um, 2%, uh, were self-describing. Okay. Interestingly, 0% transgender which i i don't believe i'm sorry I, I don't believe that there were zero transgender people who responded to the survey i think they just weren't putting it down okay i'm not saying that's a bad thing i'm just saying i don't believe it um sexual orientation only 74 percent heterosexual 7% bisexual, 6% asexual, 3% gay, 3% pansexual, 2% queer, 1% lesbian. I, I thought that was much more diverse than, than I was expecting, really, honestly. I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I think it's, it's a good thing. I'm just surprised. Interesting. What's that... Uh... What's that based on, do you think? Do you think that sort of, um, you know, your past experience in the industry uh, or, uh, you know? Uh... 
I think I'm just old. <laughs> um, I think understand. Okay, here's what I think. I think that the same way that I mean, I, 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 you put a note on the thing that you said you assumed that transgender people were just uh, identifying as either male or female or non-binary, and I agree with you. I think that's, I think that's the case. I, I 100% agree with you. Um, I'm pleased that 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 six percent of the people who responded felt comfortable enough to say to to respond and and put in a survey that they were not, you know, or or, or I'm sorry, not six percent, whatever percent it works out to be twenty. 26 percent in the 20s right as yeah. non-heterosexual okay that's a lot yeah um and i think it's wonderful that they felt comfortable enough to put down on their survey i am not heterosexual you know so uh, that's awesome i think it's awesome i'm just like i said i'm just surprised so um so i think that's i think it's a terrific thing and it kind of leads us into our next topic um which was also kind of a surprise for me mm -hmm. a good surprise a good surprise so there is a uh, there is an initiative called the inclusive naming initiative okay now what does that mean so uh this is an initiative to eliminate harmful terms in in, in air quotes um harmful terms in programming Okay. Um, again, I think it's a good thing. Not complaining about it. Don't no nobody try and blow up my Twitter and call me whatever. I think it's wonderful. I'm just surprised. Okay. Um, so, uh, well, what kind of terms are they talking about? Well, some of these terms are are obvious, like you know, blacklist versus whitelist, or master slave. Some of these that that's obvious and there's you know? been some discussion you know at github over the last couple of years for example about uh, you know using master to to frame a branch for uh so so you know this is definitely a step in an ongoing conversation yeah it is it is definitely an ongoing conversation and it also shows how difficult it is to to kind of you know make these these sudden changes i mean some of these changes they can seem like they're little, a little over the top. You know, they can seem like, oh, really? I mean, like segregate? You 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 have a problem with the word segregate? I mean, yes, it has a historical context to it. Um, but that's kind of the whole point is we're looking at it now. We're very close to it historically. Okay. Um, so we can't be objective about it, in, in my view. You know, I, I, I know, I know. I go back sometimes. I, I love old movies, okay. And I know there are times I go back and I watch old movies, and my mouth just hangs open, and I go, I cannot believe that was ever considered acceptable. <laughs> you know, it's just like at the time, I was like, what? You know, I mean. You can see, you can see there, you can see footage of Judy Garland in blackface. Judy Garland, okay, we're right. not, you know, and it was just considered normal. And if you had gone to them and gone, "That's terrible," how can you do that? They would have gone, "What is the matter with you?" You know, and I think so. I think a lot of the people now who may be looking at going, "What is the matter with you?" Well, you know what? Come talk to me in fifty years. Yeah, and I think this goes to the uh, valuable role that an organization like the CNCF can play as um, uh, an organizing principle, as a governance organization, uh, because they can bring in such a diverse group of, of interlocutors on the topic. Uh, you know, we're, we're here to white guys talking about it and we can react as we might, you know, uh, individually to, you know, a given 
term or another one proposed as as a tier one term to be kind of phased out right uh but the cncf structure kind of you know takes a page from the open source book and brings just a, a wide diversity of eyes to the to the issue to the problem uh and you know i think that's valuable and we're seeing too that not they're not just observing these questions or even making proclamations but uh trying to put some useful resources out into the community as well. So one of the things that's coming out of the Inclusive Naming Initiative is a, a new Linux Foundation course that's being provided for free uh, that is on uh, Inclusive Strategies for Open Source is the title of the course, uh, LFC 103. You can just take that through the Linux Foundation, uh, provides a digital badge, could be part of your kind of certification portfolio. Um, and I think that's really cool that, that they're taking particular action here and also that they've defined their goals. I mean, I think one interesting thing to talk about here is the way that the initiative has aimed to make changes, quote, without breaking code dependencies. Right. They've really framed the scope of the problem that they're trying to address, uh, interestingly, specifically. Interestingly, specifically, but <laughs> I mean that in a good way. Um... Yeah, no, I think it's good. I think it's good. Yeah. So, all right. So that is so that is definitely uh, a good thing and something to think about. You know, things that we we just sort of take for granted every day that maybe we maybe we shouldn't. All right. So, moving on to uh, the the eternal security corner. <laughs> I was going to say it if you did. <laughs> whatever we decide to call it um all right so we have we have a couple of things here um yet another security survey um this one from uh the cncf uh 85 percent of companies say that it's important obviously uh zero percent say it's not important i'm always I'd intrigued really by this worried. breakdown <laughs> yeah it's like uh yeah, you always wonder about, you know, who's that one guy who said, you know, oh, no, it's not important. And 15% just got like bored on question one and <laughs> said no and pissed that's, out. That's right. It's pissed out. Exactly correct. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it the, the survey really kind of is more about reminding us that there's a lot of work to do than anything else. I mean, um, only 9% of respondents have an automatic security procedure. Um, I, I didn't put it down here. I think 12% uh, have no procedure whatsoever, nothing written down at all. Um, what I did find interesting here was that, uh, was the types of uh, incidents. Uh, only 4% noted that they had witnessed a, a ransomware attack. I was struck by this one too. Yeah. I, I wanted to pause there for a second. I wonder if that was a question of the framing. Like, uh, what does witnessed a ransomware attack mean? Because, uh, you know, I can sort of construe myself as having a witnessed, witnessed a ransomware attack like two days ago. <laughs> um, but, um, True. You know, was this specifically in a, you know, uh, the context of a cloud native architecture within their particular company? Uh, was it just associated with their enterprises activities at all? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm super curious. Or, or is it down to the fact that 47% of respondents declined? Prefer not to disclose security related incidents. Right? <laughs> decided that we're not going to discuss it at all. So that might have something to do with it too of yeah. the people of the people who did uh apparently the top two types of incidents were um exploitation of vulnerabilities which you know we're always talking about and cryptocurrency miners um which you know i guess largely viewed as a victimless crime but it you know just wait until they figure out another way to use that <laughs> um yeah so i mean so 85% of participants uh, want the community to focus on a more secure default. And we talked about this last time that, you know, it, uh, that the fact that it's too open is, is a big problem. Um, and 60% uh, uh, wanted more security related automated tooling and they wanted more reference guides. Um, so um, 
the CNCF has launched the cloud native security map. Um, let's drop this for you guys. Um, so this kind of gives you a sense of how you can um, how you can more uh, how you can more efficiently improve your security. So uh, they're working on uh, version two of that. So that's something for people to work on. So at least there's something useful that people can do because um, it's frustrating when you get these surveys that go, nope, security's still bad. Okay, <laughs> thanks. The more you know. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Yeah, <laughs> the more you know, exactly. Um, yes, now tell me what to do about it. So uh, at least we got a good uh, resource out of that. So that's a, that's a good thing. Um, Eric, you want to talk about some, uh, so apparently there's some new critical severity warnings. Yeah, elsewhere in, in security world, um, uh, there was a critical severity warning of malware found in some widely deployed NPM packages, with NPM being the popular package manager for Node.js. Uh, so the two popular packages that had uh, the problems, capital P, uh, were the COA parser and the RS configuration loader. Uh, and for the RS configuration loader, this was versions 1.2.9, 1.3.9, and 2.3.9. And the advice was to downgrade to 1.2.8. But some kind of wider context here, uh, the security experts advice on these packages was that if they were on your system you should consider your system completely compromised uh, you should rotate out any secrets that were accessible to it um, of course you should downgrade to that uh, earlier version of the rs configuration loader uh, they also suggested that if you were using ua parser js uh, in versions 0 0.7.29 0 0.8.0 or 1.0.0 you needed to upgrade asap uh, but what struck me about this was uh, kind of how insidious it is. Like a lot of these software supply chain attacks, um, these packages could be out there in production or they might just sit on your dev box without you really thinking about it. You know, yeah. of course, oh, sorry, go on. No, no, go ahead. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're using them in a project, uh, obviously they're going to be part of that environment, but a lot of the time when we're learning about a language or just working through an approach to something, you know, you might be rocking through some code tutorials and hitting the dash G flag to install things globally. And now they're just there, you know, they're just hanging out on your system. Um, and you might not know it. Uh, that's not, of course, best security practice or best kind of like system uh, cleanliness practice, but it's easy to understand. It's easy to imagine. Um, so, you know, if you're a node developer or you even just have NPM on your system for a set of command line tools, it might be worth running a quick check. Uh, you can use just NPM list dash G to look at your globally installed packages and have a look and see if you have anything affected there. So I'm going to drop that in the in the chat there so we can see that command so people can see that. Um, that that's good. What I found interesting about this is you don't think of JavaScript as something that can really compromise your system. You know, that's, that's the main thing that I was just like, Oh, okay. So yeah. that's, uh, so, so that happened. <laughs> um, you know, so it's, uh, it's something that, you know, yeah, it's JavaScript, but that doesn't mean that it's harmless. So we need to, uh, yeah, you need to, to keep an eye on what's going on there. It's an interesting uh, thing. So uh, something to keep in mind as we go along. So um, for our uh, last security topic last here, security I'm, topic. Uh, oh, I'm wondering, yeah. Nick, what kind of ingenious technical uh, strategy did hackers use to, to breach some data? Uh, <sighs> did they get yes. into the software supply chain? Did they? Uh... So let's talk about this. So someone breached robin hood's security system and they they managed to obtain seven million uh email addresses and names and and a little bit of other information on on a few you know a few hundred other people so 
they used this incredibly sophisticated hacking method. They must have been like Keanu Reeves on the like computer that only displays green, you know, he's yes. uh, ready to go. That That's it. It's, it's this incredibly sophisticated method. They called the public computer uh, user support number and they asked. That'll do it. They asked and they got access. So, uh, yeah. So point being, all the security in the world is not going to help you if your personnel are going to fall for social engineering. That is why they call it social engineering. You know, we're joking about, oh, you know, it's not really that tech. Of but, you know, they, they managed to do it. Okay. And hopefully, you know, hopefully it took some skill for them to do it. I, I hope. Uh, otherwise... You know, full disclosure, I have a Robinhood account. You know, I don't want anybody stealing my $75 worth of Bitcoin. <laughs> you know. Oh, that's that's very relatable. You know. <laughs> um, you know, uh, my, my wife sent me that story. She said, do we need to be worried? I'm like, they stole email addresses and names. That's, you know, our email address is already out there. <laughs> Guarantee it. Um, but, you know, uh, that's it. So make sure you train your people. Um, and this is not the first time that this has happened either. I mean, a, a teenage hacker pulled a similar stunt and uh, got access to uh, the Twitter uh, user management tool. So um, so that was basically what they did. They called the, the customer support number. They uh, got access to uh, the, the user management tool. And they got all this information. So... Um, be careful. Be careful. It's not just don't don't do that. <laughs> Both this and the NPM story, you know, super different stories, <clears throat> right? Super different uh, approaches to uh, technical malfeasance. But they both remind me of uh, something our uh, field CTO, Sean O'Meara, said a couple weeks ago about if you're thinking about security being at the perimeter, then you've kind of already maybe lost the battle. That's right. Uh, if, if you conceptualize it that way, that is in itself a vulnerability <laughs> because those are not the the methods of ingress uh your, your traditional like oh okay the malware is going to hop over the wall that, that's not what you got to be worried about at, that's at right this stage you you must implement a zero trust uh architecture where no service no uh person is is uh construed to be trustworthy just because they happen to be where they are you know you just can't so um yes definitely definitely right so all right so that's our that's our security report for today a couple of fun things a couple of fun things for for, for to, to close out for today um in terms of new services we may be seeing on the cloud sometime soon so uh weta digital Peter Jackson's company that, you know, you remember Lord of the Rings and they made, uh, they were behind the effects for, you know, uh, Planet of the Apes and Wonder Woman and all that. So they're selling the uh, visual effects tech technology division to Unity, the game tools company for $1.625 billion. Um, now, not quite the $4 billion George Lucas got for Star Wars, but, you know, I'll take it. <laughs> but the important thing is that they are talking about making these tools available to creators through a cloud-based workflow. So um, this is something that, you know, normal people can now use the cloud to do things that were not necessarily normal before. Yeah, it immediately reminded me of uh, uh, Epic based uh, around me uh, in the uh, Research Triangle area of North Carolina. And, you know, they run Fortnite and all of that. Uh, and they maintain the Unreal Engine. They released something pretty similar uh, recently called the Metacumen 
uh, creator. And this is intended to leverage um, through the cloud, again, uh, these very professional VFX tools to, to render hyper-realistic human beings very quickly for games or for movies or for what have you. Uh, so it, it seems like there's kind of a burgeoning uh, as a service market for professional grade VFX and CGI creative tools. Uh, that's kind of a, a fascinating new space. It, it is a fascinating new space. And then you meld that with our next story, which is that NVIDIA is working on these uh, AI avatars where basically they are um, they are creating these little animated you know figures people and and you know not people but the point is that they are little avatars that are made for answering natural language questions so uh, the example that they give is, uh they they have a little a little figure sort of in a little I, I can't describe it but it's a little figure in a in a capsule that comes out and helps you with your menu um can tell you you know which are the uh you know which are the uh, vegetarian dishes and and so on um and they give a demo where um they are they are pretty uh, broad in questions, um, not just uh, not just simple questions like that. So if you think about what it would take if they took um, if you took this Omniverse avatar announcement from Nvidia uh, and you combine it with <laughs> the, the Weta Digital uh, people, uh, it's a little bit scary. But, Get ready for a CGI me to show up here next week. CGI, yes, yeah, CGI you, CGI you. There, there you go. Um, you know, it would get to a point where it's like, is that really you at this meeting? Oh, hey, that's a good idea. I won't have to <laughs> stop attending meetings and maybe actually get work done. And um, yeah, there's a thought. So, um, yeah, so that's. Uh, that's an interesting bit there. I mean, what would you like to see come from this technology? You know, my major response reading this was to think, am I just a grumpy person? Am I Am I just a, like, one of their examples was ordering from the uh, kiosk at a fast food restaurant, right? So you go there and, you know, today you might go to a McDonald's and, and you plug in, okay, I want a burger, I want fries. And my sort of order of preference is, I want that where I don't interact with any human being. And then I want maybe secondarily to interact with a human being. And then last, do I want to interact with a fake <laughs> human being? That's, <laughs> that's it. That's exactly it. It's like, you just do not want to, to do that. I, I agree with you um, wholeheartedly. I think that uh, people smarter than me will probably come up with creative applications of this technology in ways that uh, thrill and terrify us. But uh, the examples that they're putting in these demos kind of make me go like, uh, I'd rather not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but that's it. I mean, I, I'm I'm kind of with you. I am I am kind of a, a, a grumpy person too. But at the same time, um, at the same time, if it prevents me from having to answer other people's questions, <laughs> maybe it's not a bad thing, you know? Uh, you know, I mean, I suppose I'll still have to answer the 362 computer-related questions from my father, uh, you know, when he calls up. I always know I'm in trouble when I pick up the phone and he says, is this the computer service department? <laughs> uh, I always know that I'm I'm up for a screen share at that point. Uh, that one's relatable as well. <laughs> I'm still gonna have to do that. I'm still gonna have to do that. There's there's no there's no question. But um, but they're not. I mean, it's it's actually a, a pretty interesting a uh, pretty interesting thing. Um, let's see if we can show the. Let's. Just, I'm gonna try and show this demo here. Hold on a minute. Uh, share screen. I'm going to share my screen here. I don't know how this is going to work out. We haven't tried this before, but we will try it anyway. We're on the cutting edge here. We're on the cutting edge here. 
Uh, let's try Chrome tab. Uh, ba -ba -ba, da -da -da -da. Here, let's try this. So this is Jensen Huang. It looks like it. Conversational yeah. AI. It stopped? Toy me. Okay. You're going to see speech understanding, natural language processing on the largest model ever trained, speech synthesis with my own voice, character animation, and beautiful ray trace graphics, all in real time. Toy me was made with some amazing technologies that have become possible only recently, and barely so. I asked a few friends to ask this cute little guy some tough questions. Let's take a look. Hi. Hello. Hello, Toy Jensen. Hi. Please ask me anything. What are the greatest threats of climate change? The greatest threats of climate change are the effects on human health, food security, water supplies, and the environment. How do astronomers look for exoplanets? Most exoplanets are found via the transit method. That was the case for the TRAPPIST-1 planets. Anyway, so you get the idea. So I think it's, uh, I think it's pretty interesting. We're, we're on the cutting edge of a lot of these technologies, and it's interesting to see them kind of all coming together. Um, you know, you, I, I, don't know what, I, I don't want to think about what it's going to look like even two years from now. I was going to yeah. say five years from now, but I think five years from now, it'll be, we can't imagine what it's going to look like five years from now. It's just accelerating so fast. Anyway, so uh, that brings us to uh, the end of this week's news. So we hope that you all enjoyed it. And um, we would, we would love your feedback. What do you want to see more of? What do you want to see less of? You know, are we talking too much? Are we not talking enough? Are there topics you want to see more of or less of? Or um, you know, what should we call the eternal security corner? <laughs> um, and we'll see you next week at this same time. All thanks right. so much. Thank you all. Oh, and thanks to uh, our super producer, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs>